All right, it's 6.04 p.m. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. If we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is to, we have board reorganization. The first thing we need to do is to appoint a GRCSU board chair. Do we have any nominations? Uh, Lynette, go ahead. I don't know how we're doing this, um, but I'd like to nominate Lisa again. Okay. Do we have any other nominations? Okay. Uh, so we have one nomination for GRCSE board chair. Uh, do we have a, a second on that motion? I'll second. Okay. Thanks, Eric. All, right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay, well, congratulations, Lisa. You've been appointed the board chair, and I turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you. So the next order of business are nominations for vice chair. I'd like to uh, nominate Clarence Haynes. I'll second that. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor as Clarence for vice chair, please say aye. 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 Motion passes and Clarence is the vice chair. And nominations for clerk. I'll nominate Lynette to be clerk. I'll second. Is there a second? Second by Eric. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Are there other nominations for clerk? All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, and we'll fill in the other remaining members of the board. Um, a regular meeting schedule is the schedule, the meeting schedule that we currently have work for everyone, or do we want to look for a different day or time? What we're doing works for me. Yeah, it's okay. pretty flexible if we have have a conflict so yeah okay so the wednesday at 6 p.m and we will affirm to use uh robert's rules uh for small boards and i know everyone's probably already um well everyone has signed um and received the code of ethics from the vsba so I think people, you can scan those and send those back to Wendy, she told me, or if you're in Rutland, you could drop them off. And identify where agendas and me meetings will be posted. If we continue the same as posting them at our schools, post office, town office, and libraries in um, each community. And our attorney of choice. I'll nominate uh, Chris Leopold. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Eric. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Chris, if I could, um, I just heard back from Tina. She never got the invitation, so she didn't get anything on this. I sent it to her. 
Um, but that means she probably didn't get any of the paperwork either. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll forward that message to her right now. Thank you. Okay, and identify media sources. So um, we is everyone okay continuing to use the Rutland Herald and then Wells Springs like this to use somebody else to publish? And I don't remember who that is. Free Press. The Free Press? Yeah, it, uh, out of uh, Granville, New York. It, it's a free publication that covers all of Wells and all of Middletown okay. weekly. Is everyone okay with continuing with those two uh, media sources for notices? Hearing no objection. Uh, a motion would be in order to authorize the administration to request and expend available grant funds from the Agency of Education as well as state and federal funds. So moved. Second. I'll I'll second. second. Second by Clarence. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. A motion will be in order. Oh, number eight isn't for us, though, is it? I don't think we can get tax anticipation. Okay. I didn't think so. I think this is just kind of a copy of everyone else's. Um, <laughs> number nine, to authorize the board chair to sign director's orders and other documents on behalf of the board as necessary. So moved. Second. So I'll second. Second by Eric. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, the voting delegate for the VS Visbet and VSBA. Who would like to be the voting delegate? Clarence is generally the voting delegate. I was going to say, Clarence, do you want to still do it? Yeah, I I will unless someone else is planning on attending. You, know, you, you have to be in attendance to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, unless it's virtual. Right. Yeah. Mm. I'll, I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion for Clarence. I know he always goes. So, okay. Second. Oh, I'll second. Did you have a question, Eric? I was going to ask if we should also have an alternate, alternative sure. person, sure, as well. Who would you like to be the alternate, Eric? I, I can do it. I plan on attending the VSBA stuff anyway. So nice. okay, nice. is that oh, okay right. to include? Can we include that in your motion, Lynette, to appoint Clarence and um, Eric? Would and be Eric, the alternate? Uh, yeah, I think I said that. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, the executive committee is the chairs of the three um, organizing. So it would be Clarence, Lynette, and myself. I think um, Ira should be in there because of the yeah. summer. So it should be four. Okay. And Ira, and I'm not sure who the chair of Ira is. Is that Mary or is it Lance? It's Lance. It's Lance. Okay. 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 And then um, I know that in each individ at each individual board, you um, selected um, members to attend or be on committees. Um, I'm wondering, Clarence, are you willing to continue to be the chair of the policy committee? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. Okay. We can continue that. I, I canceled the last policy meeting simply because all the boards weren't reorganized and some of the members were gone and all the new ones aren't all appointed yet. So um, we can get back to it now that okay. everybody's I, I had. Think a, that committee, I think that committee um, has been moving right along and we're certainly seeing a lot of the work from the policy committee coming to all of our boards and we appreciate that. Yeah. So to keep them 
it's nice to see them on that constant schedule. Then we don't have to worry about making sure our policies um, are new. I see that Tina has just joined us. Sorry, I was late. I didn't know about it. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, I'm sorry we've already reorganized, but if something else comes up, I'll be first to appoint you to that committee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, so we I know that's why, that's why she was late. She didn't want to get nominated. <laughs> so we are reorganized. So the next order of business would be the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, changes to the agenda? If not, a motion would be in order to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. I'll second. Second by Eric. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. General public comment. Is, are there any members of the public that would like to address the board? This is your opportunity to do so. Hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. We have minutes of January 27th, 2021, and we have carousel board meeting minutes of February 16th, 2021. Is there any objection to uh, approving them in one motion? I move the adoption of the two, mo two minutes, January 27th and February 16th, as presented. Second. I will second. Second by Seth. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. I, I did have Whoops. A, a change before we okay. vote. To which one? Uh, the one for January 27th. Okay. Uh, it, it's small. I just noticed that uh, my name was left off for board members. Oh, okay. So we need to add Eric to the January 27th. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I did have a question about the carousel meeting minutes. I don't know if any of the other boards, but we um, approved those minutes at our Well Springs. Did anyone else do that as well for the carousel yeah. meeting? Yeah, Rutland Town did also. Yeah, but wasn't the carousel? I, Ira did also. But was open to each meeting like i opened quarry valley clarence opened wall springs lynette opened rutland town that's kind of so but everybody was, it, was there but wasn't the grsu there were minutes that because the supervisory union was part of that deal too yes i think that's why the minutes are here to be approved they've okay. been approved locally but the grsu itself was was had a meeting that that same function to uh, right there was a quorum yeah. of it's kind of a formality but i think that's uh that's why we would have minutes there's not much to it other than the fact they called a meeting at their meeting well they're identical so that's why i brought yeah. it up in the yeah. past carousel meetings that you know the grcsu minutes would be um a lot less detailed, but I I just want to bring that up. It, it it's fine if it's just formality. So okay, thank you. Um, so all those in favor of approving the January twenty seventh and the February sixteenth with the change to January twenty seventh, adding Eric to um the attendance sheet, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, you receive your warrants in your email. Any questions about the warrant should be directed to Lewis. So I, a motion would be in order for approval of the warrants. So moved. Second. I'll second. Second by Eric. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Chris, superintendent's report. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, a lot of these items you've heard before in your local meetings, but I'll just kind of review them. So uh, obviously, you know, the, the past 
month, month and a half has really been, you know, getting for uh, get things ready to go for all of our town meetings, budget votes. I uh, just wanted to just publicly once again, just say thank you to all of our community members for voting yes on the budget and continue to support our schools. It is greatly appreciated. I also want to thank, um, uh, just one second, Mike Moser is joining us. Um, sorry. Uh, I also just want to say thank you to all of our building administrators uh, and to, to Lewis for all their work, uh, just in getting the budgets prepared and for all their hard work and just with the uh, presentations and everything on those lines. So uh, it was a lot of work, but uh, everything went along pretty smoothly considering the circumstances this year uh, regarding the uh, informational meeting and moving everything virtual. So uh, as last thing, just to thank all the town clerks uh, for all their support. They did a, a great job. I know there's a lot of anxiety, but uh, like I said, everything went really well, and we're, we're very happy with that. Uh, I would like to take this moment to congratulate uh, two GRCSU teachers uh, who have been recognized as outstanding teachers in the state of Vermont. Uh, this typically is done in the fall, but because of COVID, things kind of been moved around. Uh, these two individuals will be recognized at the 40th annual uh, Outstanding Teacher Day. Uh, typically, this is held up the, on campus at the University of Vermont, but this year, obviously, with COVID, we can't do that. So there will be a virtual uh, broadcast for this, but and that'll be on Wednesday, April 7th at 4 p.m. Uh, so when I have the information, uh, I can share if any board member would like to uh, tune into that. Uh, I do believe uh, they will make that public. But uh, the two individuals who have been recognized this year are Christina Kerber from Pulteney High School and Courtney Ell uh, Elliott from Proctor Elementary School. So I just want to say congratulations to the two of them. We will be uh, working on a press release as well for the Herald and uh, for the free press to recognize these two individuals. Uh, the next item is obviously COVID testing. Um, we've had our, our last round of COVID testing on March 10th. Um, it's almost, <clears throat> excuse me, um, hold on a second. I'm starting, I'm still feeling the effects of the vaccine the other day. So um, we had our last round of testing on March 10th. Uh, we had close to 200 staff members take the COVID test. And as I've been saying all along, this is just a snapshot of that moment in time. Uh, from that test, we had zero positive results. Uh, and I say that's where we also know in the past week, week and a half, we have had a large number of uh, COVID results within our uh, positive cases within our communities. Um, it's just, it's something which, uh, you know, I, I you know thought might happen uh, as, you know, spring, yeah, it started coming when things, things started to warm up a little bit. Uh, some things started to relax, uh, both in our communities. Uh, and so, uh, you know, myself and Lisa and the building ministers have been vigilant and reminding staff just in the buildings just to continue to enforce uh, the safety protocols and the guidance that we've had thus far that have allowed us to get to this point. Uh, we are also, uh, also asking all community members to continue to. Uh, the end is near. We, you know, I, we, I don't know how what near is. I mean, if you ask me to define that, uh, it's a little bit different than today. There was yesterday, but uh, with vaccines started to be, uh, you know, more and more people start to be vaccinated. Uh, you know, things start to, you know, relax a little bit more. And more, it was in you know, restaurants and bars opening up. Uh, we we still have to remain vigilant. Uh, we had to get through this year. We have to make some good decisions, and if we just continue to make good, you know, follow the guidance, do the things we need to do, properly wear a mask, and I think we should be okay. But it has been a bit of a rough patch for us. Um, but I know that uh, I do want to thank Lisa Madison, the building administrators, the school nurses, um, gave up a lot of time on the weekend and you know in the evenings just to, and doing the contact tracing. But uh, if you know there are issues, there are concerns, obviously we'll let you we'll keep in the loop. We'll let you know, but. Uh, I'm sure you have questions, but we, we are limited to what we can divulge just because of privacy and uh, with HIPAA. So, um, but uh, like I said, it, it, it's something we have been monitoring all year. And when we feel the need, we do shift to remotes uh, when necessary. We do, but the contact tracing is a very long and detailed process. And we closely, we vet out every circumstance. We look at every scenario and it's highly scrutinized. So when we do make that decision as to whether or not someone's close contact or someone is not a close contact, it's something that's gone through uh, many different sets of eyes and many different lenses and the Department of Health uh, works with us very closely. So, um, but it has been a bit of a frustrating week because we, we were in a bit of a good spell and uh, hopefully we'll kind of just get our feet back underneath us and uh, get things back to where they need to be again. So uh, along that same line, we have, uh, you know, been through our two rounds of uh, vaccinations. 
Uh, the first round was March 19th, or I'm sorry, March, uh, yeah, March 15th, I'm sorry, which was the Pfizer uh, vaccine. And then uh, on the 22nd was the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, there are a lot of staff members who also chose to go to their local drugstores and do things outside of those testing dates. Um, but majority of our staff has tested on both those dates, uh, which are, I'm sorry, receive the vaccine on both those dates. We are we're grateful for that. Uh, I do know that staff members have had some side effects. I know myself being one of them. Um, it, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. The one concern that we have is moving forward is the uh, the March 22nd with the Johnson Johnson was a one and done. Uh, the March 15th, we knew there was going to be a second round. And when we received information for those individuals who received their vaccine first vaccine shot on the 15th, the second round was scheduled for April 5th. Uh, and we have a large number of staff members who are scheduled for that day. We had asked the state to try to schedule them at, in the late afternoon or evening to avoid conflicts with schools, but uh, we, we only could do what we can do. So, but on April 5th uh, is an all day a vaccine schedule. Uh, so we are going to have a large number of staff out uh, for test, for, receive vaccine on that day. So on April 5th, we will be shifting to remote uh, on that day, it's, it's Easter Monday. Uh, in all schools, uh, we know that it can be a bit of a issue, a bit of a problem uh, for families. We understand that, but we just thought we'd just give people fair warning uh, as opposed to on Easter Sunday on that evening or early that next morning, uh, quickly making the schedule. We have close to, I think, 100 staff members uh, who need to be uh, tested on, or I keep on saying tested, I apologize, receive the vaccine on that day. So. Um, we are also looking at, uh, we, we do know that the, uh, the side effects uh, for the Pfizer shot, for the second shot, uh, we've heard some horror stories about that in terms of people have some very serious side effects. Uh, we do have some current concerns about the 6th of April, so we will make a decision as whether or not we, uh, been on staffing, how many people are out, whether or not we need to shift to remote for the 6th as well. But that's something which we will discuss, we will let you know. Uh, but that is a, a, a reality as well, that we could be remote. Well, we will be remote on the 5th, uh, but there is a high likelihood that we will be remote again on the 6th, just due to uh, staff members feeling the effects of the second vaccine shot. All right, but like I said, I just want to publicly uh, state that, let you know. But, uh, it, you know, while it's a bit of a, a headache for some, it's, it's good that we're having our staff members receive the vaccine so that uh, we can proceed and move forward. All right. Um, moving on, uh, the testing window, and I'll just briefly touch upon this. I know Lisa uh, can talk about this a little more in her assistant superintendent's report or later on, but we will be doing the SBAC and the, uh, the science assessment this year. Uh, I know that was up kind of up in the air for a while, but the, they made the determination that testing will proceed. They have extended the testing window from uh, you know, this month through the end of the school year. So we are currently working on setting up a testing schedule that's appropriate for each of our schools. When Lisa and Admin have more information, we'll release that. But the the ELA and math assessment will be for grades three through nine. That's the SBAC. And the Vermont science assessment will be for grades five, eight, and 11. Uh, another item that you may have heard about is the AOE education recovery plan. Uh, Lisa Madison and all of her spare time ha is going to be kind of chairing this, uh, <laughs> working with a lot of, you know, myself and the other admin uh, ministers, but, uh, you know, it, it, we'll have more information. I think in April, uh, we'll have a, a much more complete report about the work and where we're at. Uh, but just you know, in the superintendent's report, it gives a brief overview of what the recovery plan, uh, what it's designed, what it's to do. It's really taking a look at the end, you know, the, the spring uh, next year and, and years moving forward, just about from, you know, understand the impacts that the pandemic has had on our kids from a social, emotional, and academic perspective and uh, what we're going to be doing within each of our schools and our districts and across the SU to assist our schools and students and communities and uh, bridging those gaps and kind of uh, help our kids get back to where they need to be. Um, I, you know, I, I do want to just quickly note, though, that while the recovery plan does talk about deficits and gaps. I, I and I said this before, our teachers have done a, a, a great job this year. Um, as we look at the data that we have, the gaps are not as drastic as we're seeing with other supervisory unions. I think our, our teachers have done a phenomenal job of, uh, you know, from a social emotional standpoint, to the best they can, working with you know students who are both in person and remote, still trying to to create these these communities. Uh, you know, 
uh, working with kids just to, to touch on touch upon the social emotional aspect and the academic piece as best as they can. Uh, despite our best efforts, we know that there are going to be some gaps, but we're, we'll have a plan to address those and work with the staff on that. All right. Uh, the last piece that I just have is just the legislative updates. Uh, as you all saw in your regular report, uh, it was just a, a copy of just the second um, thing. I think one of the things that you may have heard about is the universal school meals. I just heard about this today from Senator Terenzini that uh, the S100, which is a bill in place, it's looking at, uh, you know, at providing meals for all students for free of charge. It's breakfast and lunch. Uh, and I think uh, these uh, Senator, Ter Senator Terenzini informed me today that they've decided to hold off on uh, voting on that or discussing that until you know, I have a little bit of time to understand the funding uh, for this bill as well as the, the impact. Because I think one of the, the way it's written right now is the fact that anything that federal state does not cover, that the local boards uh, will be responsible for covering. So they just wanted to better understand that. So I think we, we no one will disagree with the spirit of the, the bill. I think it's just the concern is just in terms of the financial impact they'll have upon our local districts and communities. Um, so that's all I have for tonight. Uh, any questions on any of that? I know I, I threw a lot at you, but. I have a question. Yes. Uh, for the um, education recovery plan, it says uh, that you you have identified who will comp comprise of the district level recovery team. Does that mean there's going to be a team for each district or is there just one whole team? There is one big team for the SU that we have in place that uh, we, it's been limited to eight to 10 members. And that you can see it's actually on the AOE website. Uh, it can tell you about the composition of the team. It's, it's not a mandatory, but uh, we've limited that. What we then have broken it down to, and Lisa could talk a little bit more about this if, if, if you want, but uh, is subcommittees that will then really kind of take a look at the unique needs within our communities, and within our schools. Uh, so we we met once. Uh, I know that the uh, committees met today with uh, some of their building lo building level committees, stuff like that. So it, it's going to be a pretty uh, vast pr uh, pr process. And I think at the next GRCSU meeting, I think you know Lisa and I can work on that. We can pr have a presentation, kind of where we're at, uh, what you know, where the steps are at. We, like I said, we just had our first meeting a week ago, um, so we are at the the early stages of getting all this uh, together. And a lot of the the SU money that you've heard. Um, and we just found out that uh, the SU and Lewis maybe talk about this, but we have, I think it's like $3.6 million in SR3 money for the uh, the SU. So, uh, but a lot of that money will be tied to what's in the education recovery plan. So, um, you know, it, it has to be a real thoughtful process. All right. Thank you. Yep. Lisa, is there anything you want to add? I'm sorry. I, no, you did a great job of um, giving that. I think the the structure wise, Eric, it's we have a SU level committee that's like Chris said, smaller and a variety of roles, and then the the three task forces are aligned with the three main areas of the plan. Um, one is around academic success, another around engagement and truancy, um, and a third around social emotional needs, health and wellness. Um, and so then each of those task forces has chairs that sit on the district level team. Um, and those chairs are coordinating a broader cross section of staff from across buildings for each of those task forces um, to inform and advance that work. Uh, our, there's a timeline um, that the agency has released. So for April 15th, we have to submit a preliminary draft of our needs assessment, which pulls together all of our readily available data in each of those three areas. Uh, for the state and outline some of our initial thinking around strategies and approaches um, to address student needs in those areas. Um, and then we'll continue to work on refining that and uh, developing a, a more articulated plan. And that is due to the agency on the 1st of June. Um, so it's a, a truncated, uh, intense timeline. Um, and as Chris said, we'll be aligned to, to that SR work. But I'm, I'm very grateful. We've got some great great folks on that team who uh, just jumped on. And we know that our schools have, school staff who have been helping provide data have really had to kind of scramble um, and get information to us very quickly for that timeline. So we appreciate all their help. Um, they're doing a, doing a great job helping us to frame the work that's ahead of us to make sure that all our, all our students are on track. All right, great. 
all that information's on the AOE's website then, right? Okay. So I just had a couple questions about the recovery plan. Um, so will the board see like a draft of what the plan is prior to being submitted to AOE? And do we anticipate that the plan will be um, fully put together enough that we're going to provide any kind of supplemental help to students during this summer? So the, the board obviously will see a draft of the plan uh, that will is submitted to the AOE. So yes, you'll be looped in every step away. We'll provide regular updates as we go through. So from this point on, we will provide, whether it be at the local district uh, board meetings or the GRCSU, um, and we might, uh, one of those two or actually both might be. So, and then with the supplemental, one of the asks of the, um, the ESSER funding, particularly ESSER 3, is that we really look and delve into providing uh, enrichment programs during the summer for our students. And it's something which we, I met today with some central office. We have a meeting set up with the admin team for Friday to discuss uh, enrichment programs for our students, not just academic recovery, but we're really looking at enrichment because I think it's something where uh, I think we, we could do a, a great job of really providing our kids with some great opportunities over the course of summer to uh, just do, you know, to just learn, just to, to explore in many different ways. And I think, we, you know, uh, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity that we we're take advantage of this money that's coming our way and, and do a lot of great things with it. I have a question on the money. Uh, you some number you just mentioned for the SU. That's uh, that's something that we're going to have over three years, as I understand it. It's not all this has to be spent this year. It's a two or three year program before all the funding comes, and and it's going to go for this this recovery plan. It's supposed to. It's, this that's the funding for it. So it's not a one shot deal and gone. It's it's um, over a three-year period. Correct. Correct. It's through 2023. I think I do believe it's June of 2023. So there is a extended period because they know that the uh, they say academic recovery. Uh, they but they know that's you know the the impact of this pandemic is going to be felt for a long time. So it is a, a longer process for us to kind of work with this money and uh, and you know like I said you know this is a a, a cash flow or a windfall that. I don't think I've ever seen in my 27 years of education. I don't think I'll see it again in 27 years. So, uh, but we said so we don't have to just spend it for, so you can be intentional with this and really look at how we can really use this to best support our, our kids. And just, you know, uh, and that's really what it's going to be about is, you know, every decision through the lens of, you know, what's going to be best for our kids and how going to support their learning and also equitable access to education for all of our learners across the SU. That, that, that's the driving force. So we do have some, some time to, use, to spend that money. Clarence, but I think we don't want to wait as well. If there are things we need yeah. to take care of right, right now, we're going to we'll take care of that. And then obviously as we go through, we'll see, you know, you know next spring, next winter, uh, you know, we may have some other issues we need to address. We still have funding available to address issues that arise as we go through. And just like with any other plan, you know, like as most of us are teachers, the curriculum cycle, we, we all, we, just because we set this plan for, we'll constantly be reviewing it, editing it, revising it. And you know, better align it, and, and we will have staff impact on this plan as well. So teachers will be a part of this process, uh, as well as kind of driving this this next step forward. I'm just uh, concerned that we could build an infrastructure that involves a lot more hiring of people, and then all of a sudden that we're going to come to a point where we're going to have to fund them locally when it ends, or or cut the yep. program, so, uh, so I think we need to look at that as as it's built. So Clarence, you're right. I mean, even though there's a lot of money, we are approaching this as if it's a, a grant. And I think whatever, you're 100% correct. We have to be very careful uh, using this money towards staffing or towards you know people because, uh, and you know, no matter what we do, we really have to start to build capacity that we can continue that a, a program or a resource or a philosophy or an approach uh, well after things are gone. And, and that yeah. that's something which we have to be very intentional about, uh, you know, how do we begin this process, but all, how do we also wean ourselves off the process, but continue the, the great things we we have begun. So it, it's it's not going to be just spending, you know, on, on programs. And, and then, like you said, when it all dries up, we go back to the local boards and say, well, now we need to add X amount of dollars. That's not our goal. 
our goal really is over the next three years is to really look at what you know what needs to be done, how we can support our teachers, how we can support our, our communities and our students, and then build the capacity to continue that without uh, having our, our the local taxpayers feel the pinch. And I think from that standpoint, that's why it's really important to build relationships and partners within each community for whatever enrichment program we're looking to do. Because if each community sees the strength and the value of it, they're more likely, if you've partnered with outside resources from the school, to continue that work. Um, and it's just easier to build off that, I think. So So I look forward to hearing and seeing how we're going to partner with um, different entities within each community and um, these enrichment programs for kids for the summer. Did anyone else have any questions for Chris or Lisa? Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question, but it's not on the subject. It was on the vaccines. Do we have a, sure. a, a percentage of uh, staff participating in the vaccines? We do not have that information, nor did we ask for that information. So, so I mean, in terms of, we, you know, we have an unofficial, we asked about the April 5th, but we did not ask how many are, are we're getting the vaccine or not get the vaccine. So we do know that we have close to uh, 100 people on the 5th who will need to be out for a vaccine. But like I said, that's not, it's an unofficial number. We don't know how many receive the vaccine uh, 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 on the 22nd. Is, so, what kind of information is going out to staff about the vaccine? Is it, is there anything additional that's, that's going to them? So our school, uh, our school nurses are ready. If a, a staff member has a question, they have information for uh, the individuals. But we are, you know, the administration is not uh, providing information regarding a you know, any health related. And that's been our kind of our our stance from the uh, from the get go is the fact that that we're not. I'm not a medical expert, uh, and uh, we've asked the nurses that if someone needs a um, needs some more information or has a question, that they can reach out to them. I think some of our nurses have. Uh, given some information to some of their staff members, but we have not uh, provided any information regarding uh, the Johnson Johnson or Pfizer vaccine. So, but uh, I do expect our, a lot of our staff members, being adults, would do the research. Uh, I know I did a lot of research before I just uh, made a decision to get the vaccine or not, just so I better understood what what it was. Yeah, if, the like, state, we, the state saying, is we, indicating that there isn't is much participation in the vaccine uh, uh, statewide with the teachers. So that's why I'm asking. I, like I said, I, I, I don't know. I know a lot of our teachers were excited to, to have the opportunity to receive the vaccine, but like I said, it's not, it is a personal decision, which I respect. And so therefore, if a, uh, a teacher you know, wants to receive that, then that's great. I support that decision. If they don't, uh, and I, I support that decision as well. So I, I don't have the actual number, Meredith. I, you know, all those. But uh, I, like I said, I don't know what's been reported statewide. I've necessarily seen all those numbers. But uh, like I said, I just I know down here there are a lot of people who are frustrated because they there are a lot of uh, the vaccine slots were filling up pretty quickly when they were going to mm -hmm. register. So. Okay, T Tina has her hand up for a question. Tina? Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, we had a lot of staff at our office um, get the Pfizer vaccine all on the same day. And when they got the second, we had, I'd say, three out of about um, 14 employees that got it that called out the following day, just to give you a rough estimate um, of percentage of, you know, second. And I think our age is very similar to the schools. Um, right. And so, uh, I would also yeah, say- I just, Can I just say something real quick? I mean, so to understand, I think what our concern really is, is not just, I think there are people who preemptively will be calling out sick because they anticipate potentially being. So uh, that's why we said we don't know yet on the six. Uh, I also know in talking with, you know, our nurses that, that there are many different impacts in terms of some people feel great, some people don't. So it's very difficult to, to predict, and that's why right now on the sixth, we still it's up in there. We have not, we did not shift to remote after the first two vac vaccination dates. Our just our concern is just, um, you know, what's going to happen on the sixth. So, uh, so I well, so thank you for that feedback. Like I said, but you know, we're we're dealing with the information we have, and like I said, so we're just 
I, you know, I, I know that there are others who said they've had a negative impact on this. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is what it is. So I, I, you know, I was just giving you our experience for, to help right. you with your decision making. But um, the other thing I wanted to add is, you know, you are your personality might be one that goes and researches a lot of information before getting this vaccine. But I don't think everybody does that. Um, so I think um, having the nurse send out a little blurb to the staff about, you know, some ideas leading up to the second dose, like staying hydrated, making sure you're taking, you're, you're getting your vitamins, um, not preemptively using Tylenol or Motrin, that kind of thing. Just like little common sense things that, you know, you probably looked up, but um, that not everybody is as thorough or as inquisitive. Um, so just a thought. I, I Thank you, Tina. I'll bring that to the nursing group to uh, make sure that information is provided. Thank you. It's good. All right, any other questions for Chris? Lisa, did you have other things to add for your report? Not very many. Uh, we've been working on a lot of the same projects together recently. Um, just I wanted to add uh, two more pieces with SBAC um, and state testing for this year. Um, one is um, there is no phys ed assessment this year. That's also one of the state required assessments and they have uh, waived that requirement for this year. The assessment is available for PE teachers um, if they want to use sec sections of it to just evaluate student progress um, in their classes, but they will not be administering the test um, on a massive scale. Um, and the other piece about SBAC testing, which is very unique this year um, and will present some interesting dynamics for everyone, um, is that the state is requesting that we include our remote learners in SBAC testing. Um, and we need to do that with them on site in our buildings. Um, we are not able to give SBAC remotely, to administer it remotely. Um, so that means that remote learners will need to come into school buildings to participate. Um, I know that the schools are already starting to reach out to um, the families of those individuals and trying to find times either like Wednesday afternoons or after school times when um, other students are not in the building um, to bring those learners in to assess. Uh, there is an expectation that we will make every attempt possible to engage those students. Um, there is a medical exemption form. So if a student is considered med medically fragile or if they live with someone who is medically fragile and they're able to document that um, with medical notes, then we can apply for a medical exemption for them. Um, as of right now, uh, the participation expectation for SBAC is 95% or better participation. Um, in normal years, we're held accountable for that by the state and we get um, uh, I have point, points off uh, of our scores, uh, our, our overall uh, annual snapshot data um, will, will be lower if we don't reach that participation threshold. Um, the state was talking about applying for a waiver to the federal government um, to reduce that threshold of 95% participation. Uh, as of now, I have no information that that has either been applied for or received by the state of Vermont. Um, I'll keep you posted as we go. Uh, but our schools right now are um, are just, they're going to have to work really hard with families to try and get as many of those remote learners assessed as possible. Um, it's a great benefit for us also. It gives us a more comprehensive data set and allows us to really um, compare where students were two years ago, the last time SBAC was administered, to now. Um, as you know, we have schools in the school improvement um, categories for equity and comprehensive supports. Um, and that, that annual snapshot is driven by SBAC data. Um, so those schools are sort of in limbo at the moment, waiting for data um, to be able to demonstrate to the state uh, the impact of the efforts that they're putting in and also um, how the pandemic has affected those. So nice to be able to compare apples to apples. Sometimes um, we're, we'll do our very best to work with every family and try and find a uh, a situation that will allow them to feel comfortable and confident uh, having their student come into the building for SBAC testing um, where appropriate. And, um, and you have my written report, so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Does anyone have any questions for Lisa or anything on her report? I have a question or two. Okay. Uh, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, will we, 
on your report, will we get to see the continuous improvement plans at all? So the state is um, has has us doing the recovery plan instead of continuous improvement plans this year. Um, so they've shifted that requirement. Um, so what what will happen in our eventual recovery plan is we'll have district level goals and strategies, but there will be school specific activities within that um, based on where every school is. And that will replace our continuous improvement plans this year with the exception of our two proctor schools um, that are, are will still be required to create continuous improvement plans this year. Um, we'll also have a district level data inventory. Uh, last year that was done at the school level um, and the state has shifted that. So similarly this year, I, I will submit one on behalf of the supervisory union, but it will have school specific data included within some of the sections um, instead of individual school data inventories. Um, I think that's the state's way of trying to acknowledge that um, they want everything streamlined. They don't want us to have a district recovery plan and a school improvement plan and this plan and that plan. You know, they really want us to be focused and to have coherent and strategic work going on that is really well aligned and is the clear priority for everybody um, so that we can make progress in those, those three primary areas. And they didn't want to dilute that um, inadvertently by having schools kind of off on their own with planning purposes. Right, and these these plans are are they supposed to go into effect next school year? Yes, yeah, so up for the upcoming school year, so the July first to June thirtieth, um, twenty one twenty two. I can't remember the the continuous improvement plans. Those are done every one or two years. <laughs> well, the state changes their mind every one or two years, and so then we work on their timeline uh, at that time. Um, we we review them annually. Um, and the state has had a few different approaches to that over the last five, six years that I've been part of that process. Um, so we look at them annually anyway, and we set annual goals regardless of state requirements, because um, obviously you want to be looking at your current data and making plans for how you can continue to grow for the following year. Um, but that's all unclear at this point. There's a, for our schools that are um, comprehensive supports uh, designated schools, they are on a three-year cycle for eligibility for that. And so the state is looking at every three years, do they continue to be eligible for comprehensive supports? But they've also extended that deadline because of the pandemic. So we're not entirely certain what it will be yet. Oh, boy. OK. And um, the, the only other question I had, and, and it goes back to the um, the AOE recovery plan thing, I just wanted to to ask, does that consist of just teachers and and SU employees? Like, who makes up that? I don't know, like, who specifically, but in general. Um, yeah, so the, the SU level team, the state gave us a recommended composition um, for who should be on that team. Um, and so we've got um, guidance staff, nursing staff, uh, external partners through the tapestry program um, and some district level special educators um, like Christine and Kimberly, um, admins, principals, um, but then the task forces for each of the main areas um, are have some administrative intervention but are more focused on school-based staff. Um, so all levels in different um, ways. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you, Lisa. Uh, moving on to personnel. We have one resignation in the packet for Kathy Riley, a speech language pathologist, and her letter of resignation was also in your packet. A uh, motion would be in order to accept her resignation, or her retirement, I'm sorry. So moved. Um, so I'll second it, but it does say resignation. No, I think it says retirement over the top. Resignation is the next one. Yeah, somewhere in the letter, both words are used. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll second it. I know, Lynette, I know it is a retirement. She's done 35 years, so we've been very fortunate to have her. Exactly. She deserves it. No problem. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Motion passes. And then the resignation, we have <clears throat> Travis Churchill, who is a uh, West, West, Village School. West Village School uh, maintenance staff. So he resigned February 10th, it looks like. So a motion would be in order to accept his resignation. So moved. Second. Second. Second by Clarence. All those in yep. favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Now we have two non-renewals. And it says the notices have been sent for Frederick. And I'm not going to attempt the name. And Corey Pollock. Um, so do you want to explain to us uh, for members that are new, Chris or Lisa, what, what that means, the non-renewal? Uh, these are just uh, probationary teachers who come to the end of the probation. We decided not to uh, renew their contract this time. And both of these individuals, their certification issues as well. They did not complete the work they needed. So. Okay. Are there any questions by board members? Are, are, these, the, are, are these the only two teachers that are going from two to three years? No. Yeah, three. So these are the, the only two that will be non renewed. These are the only two not being asked back. Okay. Why I ask is a few years ago, this board made a decision that all of contracts for anyone that was moving from two to three years the board would get a chance to look at them before they were issued for the following year. Um, Clarence, Clarence, if I could, if there are particular schools, I, I, or it should be their school board, that district board that um, has that information, I don't think it's something we necessarily want to talk about here. Well, I've been only thinking of the ones that are GRSU employees, not the individual board ones because we do employ teachers now that we never used to. Right, right. You know, I, th th this may not be, there may not be any, or, th or there might be, you know. you know. Um, I mean, this was one of Matt's bugaboos that he, that came before the board, the board adopted it. So I just wondered if there, I have no problem that these, these two here is the recommendation but there ought to be a list of the others that were, that were by not doing anything, we're affirming that they should be going ahead. I mean, those, if, there, those... if there is a problem, if there is a problem, it would have to be executive session anyways. I, yeah. I, I understand because believe me, Matt was on my board, um, but we've got a, it's a really thin line here. Would you like to move the personnel piece to executive session if there are questions? I have no problem taking care of these two right now. Okay. But I'm, I'm just asking about if there are others that we ought to at least get a cursory yes or no. And that ought to be done in, in executive session. I'm, I agree with that. Okay. Yes. So the question is, are there people moving in their contract from a – from a that are still in a probationary moving to their final year. Moving to more permanent status. Yes. So you're asking if there's so a probationary all... teacher moving to their third year. Yes, there are individuals yeah. who will be moving to their third year here at the GRCSU. Okay. So, so we could talk about uh, those at an executive session for right, just a minute. Okay. And that information was not shared with me, Clarence, just in terms of the process or what the board wished. So, uh, so we could talk a little bit more about that and move forward. If that's how the board wants us to do, then we'll make sure we get that done for you. Okay. So at this point, a motion will be in order to accept the two non-renewals um, per recommendation of administration. So moved. Second. I'll second. Second by Seth. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And now we have one year contracts expiring as the next um, grouping. Emily Fox, Rachel Grenier, Julie Irish, Thomas, and Jamie Thompson. Are there any questions about that group? I'll, uh, I'll move to accept the recommendation of the administration on one year contracts that are expiring. Okay. Did you leave out, did you leave out one of the names on purpose? I just didn't try to say Thomas's last name. Okay. Thank you. I just, I wasn't sure if I didn't hear it or. No, I, I try not to, to butcher the names. <laughs> Uh, second would be in order. Nobody I'll wants second. to second. Okay. Seconded muted. by Eric. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The next grouping is professional staff, of which we have... Emily Fox, who is a math interventionist at Proctor Elementary School. And it has an adjusted salary because she is moving from 0.67 to full time. Are there any questions about that? A motion would be in order to accept her movement from 6.7 to 1.0. With the adjusted salary. So moved. Second. I'll second it. Second by Lynette. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The next grouping is FY22 non union administrators contract. So we have Greg Connors, Christine Cam, Lisa Matson, Louis Malazzo, Christopher Sell, Kimberly Stedman, and Margaret Thomas. And you can see some of them are in the last year of their contract. Are there any questions about those contracts? I, I do, um, because so many of them are second year of two year. Um, is this board looking at extending them out a year or not? Hmm. Is that a discussion we want to have in executive session since it's a contractual conversation? I would say yes. Okay. So would you like to hold that grouping until after executive session? Yep. Okay. The second grouping is FY22 union teachers interim contracts. And you see that one is highlighted yellow and it's explained to the right why. Are there any questions about that listing? Hearing none, a motion would be in order to approve the FY22 union teachers interim contracts. Are these? I'll move. I'll move. Clarence? I just, I just wonder if these are some of the positions that, that I was inquiring about earlier. Without any dates here, I can't determine that. Um, 
Would you like to hold this grouping till executive session? <laughs> What was the deadline that we had to notify teachers of renewal or non-renewal? Chris? Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. Uh, we have uh, the 15th. Of, of April. April. Of April. Yeah, yes. Okay. So we definitely, so we definitely need to do it tonight. There's no question about that. Yeah. Do. You, but do I'm just not sure. I'm not sure if Chris has the information we need or we're going to ask him for because he had no idea of what we were talking about. So yeah, I mean, I, this is where I it just, like I said, I had, had I known uh, even this afternoon, uh, we could have quickly had this information for you. But like I said, I did not know that Clarence or that this was something that the board had voted on in the past and this is what you had wanted. So. I could have uh, quickly had all this information here for you. So I could uh, maybe quickly, while we're going through this meeting, just do some research uh, and see if I can have it by executive session for you. Uh, but So would you like to hold the remainder of the personnel till executive session? I think it'd be a good idea. Okay. So we can move on to um, open positions and there was a letter um, outlining what those positions were, just informational in your pocket. So we could move on to finance and we can let Lewis take over and it's all yours, Lewis. Good evening. Uh, so I only have one thing tonight and it's just the issue board approving the subgrant agreements. Uh, these subgrant agreements have come to all your local boards. So this is, shouldn't be the first time you're seeing them. Uh, there's four in total, two for Well Springs and one for Rutland Town and one for Cory Valley. Uh, these are agreements saying that the SU is going to subgrant CRF funds to the local uh, districts. Um, anytime we get federal funds and we're not spending it directly at the SU, we just have to have one of these uh, subgrant agreements in place. Uh, all of this money has already been spent. Uh, I'm just working through all the paperwork to make sure that we have everything on file uh, in case we get audited and for our year end um, annual audit. Um, so uh, I can go through the amounts if you like. Otherwise, uh, like I said, you've already seen these at the local levels. It's just now approving them at the SU level. I move the approval of the sub grants. Second. Second. Second by Seth. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And did you have other things for us, Lewis? Uh, that's all I have tonight, but I just will give you a heads up. So as we're looking at spending ESSER money, uh, we're debating now as to whether we're going to subgrant that down to the local level. Um, so uh, if we decide to subgrant, though, that money as well, then you'll be seeing a similar report come to you in the future for ESSER money. And what would make, what would be the defining to do it that way or not to do it that way? It seems like this is an easier route for you to do it this way. Um, so with smaller grants, it, I mean, it creates an extra step to subgrant monies and so an extra bookkeeping step every time. Uh, so each quarter and then at the end of the year, uh, because we're transferring money and we have to transfer that then back to the SU in order to claim for reimbursement. Um, so depending on how we're spending the money, it's easier not to subgrant. Uh, but with the amount of ESSER money we're getting and the way we plan on spending it, um, so for example, if we're going to be um, hiring the same people we have that are working for the local district through the grant, rather than having to create extra payroll records and then now pay them out of the SU, uh, which creates another uh, extra set of steps for for payroll and for the bookkeepers, it's going to make more sense for us to keep them at their district level and subgrant those funds. So it's just a matter of where you want to create the work, whether you're creating it with the bookkeepers and payroll or creating it for with the grant reporting and, and grant reimbursement piece. Okay. I certainly hope you create it where it's the least amount of work. That's always our goal. 
<laughs> okay. And right, not, just you. not the amount of work. It's also the transparency and the and the no, least and least chance for error. So that's what we want to go with. Right. I don't think anyone on these boards has any um, doubt in your competency, Lewis. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, we have several policies. The policy committee really um, did a great job last year, I think, and um, has really moved things along. And um, I'm grateful to Clarence for leading that and, uh, you know, putting policies in place that we needed to have in place and updating really pertinent policies. So this evening we have for the second reading, the board superintendent relation policy the harassment, hazing, and bullying prevention of students, and the electronic communications between employees and students. So those would all be for the second read. So a motion would be in order for those three policies. I move their adoption. There... Second. I'll second, second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And then I'll just read. These are just for the first reading. They'll come back to us next month. Title I, Part A, Parental Involvement Policy, the Alcohol and Drug-Free Workplace, uh, Drug and Alcohol Testing of Transportation Employees Policy, and Student Drugs and Alcohol Policy. Moving on to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Um, yeah, I, I have something that I think uh, we should discuss at some point. Um, curriculum. And, uh, and, and in what kind of format are you looking at or grade level or thinking of? I guess, you know, from a, a from an SU standpoint, I would say that um, I, I'm, and I'm sure it's in policy that, you know, the board does um, review the curriculum, um, obviously not make it. But I think that, uh, you know, for me, this is like has two parts. Number one, I like guess a parent. Number two, uh, you know, being on the board, I think it might be good to at least go through and, you know, see where we're at and um, where we're going. I, you know, you know, I look at um, uh, like trying to find the curriculum, like at least in our schools, you know, none of it's online. And, and so, um, I know. I just think um, you know it might just be a good uh, topic of discussion just to see um, you know. So, do you want to look at individual schools? I mean, or I guess I'm just trying to figure out like if we're going to say we want to see stuff. What What am I saying to Lisa Madsen? I'd like you to bring to the next meeting. <laughs> Everything, I guess. I mean, it's uh, the, the <laughs> curriculum is set. <laughs> um, I mean, do you want to start with kind of like a, a, an outline of how curriculum is developed, how, you know, like, um, like I'll just say like in Quarry Valley, currently what we're trying to do is really create, um, you know, uh, grade-based teams, I guess, is and and have the curriculum so like if you moved from let's say proctor to west rutland that that curriculum would be interchangeable that so um you wouldn't be missing or losing if you were moving kinds of things like that is that what you're looking at to see kind of what the baseline is like second grade in rutland town is um relative to second grade at um wells village right uh i would say that you know i can I can honestly say I don't know what the kids should be learning, you know, you know, in first grade and second grade and third grade. Um, there's, you know, I mean, I could ask for the information. I'm just saying, like, generally, um, it would be good to know that, um, you know, what we have for curriculum, is it, um, 
is it still um, um, relevant? Relevant, and does it apply to remote learners? I mean, there's just I guess there's a lot of ways we can go, and um, I know as but long should as should that be at the district level? Well, I. I would say no. I think, like I said, I, I believe we have a policy that says that, there, you know, the the curriculum is, you know, set at the SU level. So, yeah, Eric, the policy, it's G1, and it does talk about the GRCSU. Uh, is The GRCSU board is responsible for establishing supervisory union-wide curriculum. Uh, and it talks about, you know, assisting in the... Uh, implementation, development, coordination, evaluation. And it does say the boards will periodically update, uh, uh, it'll be periodically updated regarding curriculum revisions. And so Eric, if that's something maybe you, me and Lisa wanted to kind of you know, talk about a little bit further about uh, putting together a, um, something we can bring back to the local boards as well. I, I have no problem meeting to just kind of go through that and see exactly what it is. Cause curriculum is a pretty vast Topic, I think, but I think we can narrow that down and really, you know, look at, you know, how we can provide like an update and what's going on. So I think that'd be, I think it's good because it does say in the policy that uh, we periodically will update, we'll review it. And I don't know when the last time, to be honest, the board has updated, reviewed, or, or just saw curriculum, whether it be an SU wide or local district. So that might be a good practice as well. Probably during the merger. Yeah, I, I I think we where we did we did have programs at every meeting that reviewed all the aspects of whether it was curriculum or special ed, and it is time consuming. So you wouldn't want to do bite off more than you can chew in any one meeting. Um, not that it shouldn't be done. I think it should, but it's you know it's gonna carve out a chunk of time. Okay, yeah, I'd be I willing think... to do that. We have, uh, we've got it in pieces, you know, but I think, as you said, if, if the SU uh, does it more consistently, we have some, uh, see, like, we get, we're kind of after the fact that I know Wells Village, in most schools, are using this, uh, I want to, I'll butcher the name, but uh, um, where they, Positive uh, uh, equity. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't even think of it. That, that PB, PBIS. 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 <laughs> positive. What? Whatever. That's this is a good program. It takes a while to implement, but there's, we've had some real good results. I don't know whether that's district wide or not. I, I would be interesting to see one if it was, and two if it's not. Why are we doing it? and not somebody else, is it working positively or is it uh, something that we're spending a lot of time and money on that probably would be better spent elsewhere? I, I don't know those answers as a board member. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think that Eric is talking about. We ought to know all these pieces of the curriculum, just an overview, you know, on what's going on for the whole SU. You know, I, I think that's what this policy gets to in a hurry. So. I think that's something that we could bite in small pieces at future meetings. You know, I think that makes perfect sense. So I, I'm not trying to add more work for myself or anyone else, but would this be something we could also look at having a small committee, which would convene to look at this and then the committee could then present to back to their local boards as well. Uh, Cause it's going to be, it's not going to be just a one meeting thing. It's going to be something which we're going to be doing on a, regular periodic basis. I mean, when you get into curriculum, it, it gets pretty daunting. It, you can get down the rabbit hole pretty quick. And so, like we said, in just one meeting, 30 minutes, we, we could spend a whole evening talking about curriculum and still not cover, uh, you know, 90% of it. There's just a lot there. So um, I, I have no problem. I know Lisa and I have talked before about it's, it's always important for us to continually revisit things and look at where we're at. And I said, if this is part of a, a board policy, which it is G1, that's uh, I have no problem just finding time just to meet and just, you know, take a look at where we're at and, um, and how we can present back to the board. So it might just be easier to be in having like a regular group that takes a look at that and then presents back. And as opposed to just try to do that all one 
one shot at a meeting, which uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I just, whatever so, your pleasure is. If Eric is volunteering, what if, uh, how about two other board members to, to work on that? So Tina was late, so maybe she'd like to volunteer. <laughs> I was actually uh, about to volunteer. I'd be happy to look at you... curriculum benchmarks and figure things out. Great. Thanks, Tina. Great. No problem. Thanks, Eric. And, and who else? One more person. What school's not represented yet? Um, Quarry Valley. Seth, would you like to volunteer? He stays muted, right? I was trying to pretend that it wouldn't unmute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> I'm possibly interested. I wouldn't argue that curriculum is anywhere near my strong suit um, at all. However, uh, all right. How about if? How about if it's uh, if Seth is the person and I'll be the alternate, then. So you can send it out to us, and hopefully, Seth will be there. Well, <laughs> it's, it's almost better, Seth, if you are the ignorant one in the bunch, because then we'll all get better informed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, provided I ask the questions and don't just say, "Okay, yeah, sure." Um, but <laughs> okay, yeah. so Eric, Tina, and Seth—that sounds like a great committee to uh, meet with Lisa. And Chris, and um, yeah, I think that's great. We have we often have these uh, conversations at local board member or at local boards, but it's good to to look across the issue. All right, is there any other new business to come before the board? Hearing none, a motion would be in order to go into executive session for personnel. So moved. At 720. Uh, Second. Lee. Yeah, Chris. Also, I'm sorry, Meredith. Can I invite uh, Lisa Madison and Christy Cluey? There's one personal discussion that we did have. I need uh, those two individuals in there. Then if we could do that at the beginning. Absolutely. That, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. So we'll move, the board will move into executive session with Chris, Christine, Christy, and Lisa Madison. And we'll excuse everyone else. <laughs>